All right, so we'll, we'll get started. So uh, my name is Jason Edwards, right? So I am currently a cybersecurity principal at Amazon. I work in a place called Store Security where we don't catch shoplifters, that's not what we do. Uh, we provide security for the Amazon store. So the Amazon store is the largest part of Amazon uh, in, in 60 plus countries around the world. Uh, we have over 57,000 applications we have to secure, and I work with several thousand really, really smart people, all very much smarter than me, thank God. Um, I was an Army veteran. I, I'm sorry, I am an Army veteran. I was in, I was in the Army for 20 years. Um, I joined in 1991 from the grand state of Illinois and uh, did about 10 years enlisted and 10 years as an officer and, re and retired here at uh, Fort Sam Houston here in Texas, where... Believe it or not, it got below seven degrees this morning, seven zero. I think it was like sixty five, and I believe we deployed the National Guard for an emergency. So uh, not a normal day for us, although it's supposed to get a little bit colder. We're a little twitchy after snow apocalypse a couple of years ago. So um, I have worked uh, in several places after I after I left the military. I, insurance. Um, I worked as the director of security for an en energy company that was nationwide. And, and a few other jobs. Uh, most recently, I was the chief of staff to the CISO at USAA. You've all heard of USA. It's a great company and their security is really good, by the way, throw that out there. Um, and I enjoyed that for almost five years. About three months ago, um, I changed tack a little bit and I was, um, I was offered a role at Amazon as a principal. And so what I do is I work in strategic growth programs for cybersecurity. I help people build pathways into cybersecurity careers. And today I was asked by our great military affairs team to come in here and talk to you all about um, some cybersecurity jobs, about um, the way Amazon helps veterans. And then I got a couple slides on just things I have learned the hard way over the past 10 years, right? Which I hope helps all of you as you prep for, a, you know, if you've already been out prepping for another job or as you get ready to leave and prep for another job. Just a lot of stuff that I wish people would have told me. Uh, that uh, now seems kind of obvious, but I know 10 years ago, it definitely was not obvious, right, for me. So uh, feel free to chat in the chat room as we go along. I may not see your chats, but um, uh, if I do see some questions in there, I will totally answer them as we go through it. Afterwards, uh, free and open for questions, right? Now, also, I'd like to point out that Amazon has a booth in the Expo. If you look on the left side right there, it's Expo, it says button. Don't click it now, it'll, you'll leave. But uh, if you go there afterwards, you can, uh, you know, you can sign up for interest and the military affairs team at Amazon will get back to you. There's some good stuff we're going to talk about. So let's go ahead and get started if I can remember how to do this. All right. So there's a lot of cybersecurity jobs out there right now, just in an enormous amount. I'm going to talk about it. But worldwide, we are seeing a massive shortage in cybersecurity. And, th and that means all jobs in cybersecurity, right? Everybody usually assumes cybersecurity is technical only, right? If, if I'm not an engineer or I'm not a pen tester, you know, that's not cybersecurity. That's absolutely not true. We need everybody from security awareness training to auditors to QSAs, all the way over to threat hunters and, and, and you know, VM and, you know, vulnerability management and engineering and penetration testing and, and all those kind of things, just everything in between there we are desperate for. I think I, about a year ago, I spoke at Indeed's conference and uh, just on the site that day, they had 5,500 jobs open for security awareness training, right? For people to go out and teach people in the business how not to click on phishing links, right? And that is only getting worse, right? So, uh, and, and, it, and it has been trending worse because of the need for cybersecurity. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that, right? It is not because suddenly everybody's like, hey, cybersecurity. Well, that is kind of the case, right? But it's also because a lot of private sector enterprises are starting to feel punishment for cybersecurity, right? We saw that start about five years ago, really after the Target attack and then the Equifax attack, right? It is just not acceptable now for a business to lose your data, right? Before then, and some court rulings had prevented businesses from being punished at all, right? Um, but now state laws and privacy laws are coming out in all the states. The federal government hasn't passed a cybersecurity law since 1985, I believe, which is a CFAA, but the states have picked it up. All 50 states are passing privacy laws, they're passing uh, cybersecurity laws, they're passing, passing breach laws, and it is just a ton of legislation that is forcing businesses now to start to do the right thing, which means that they need people to help them do the right thing. Uh, and there's also a lot of companies, especially uh, managed service providers that are just desperate for cybersecurity folks, right? And so it's a great time to transition into cybersecurity. It really, really is. And, and cybersecurity, I just can't keep singing the praises about it, but it's 
it's a great career, right? And it's, it's always changing. It has changed enormously since just the 10 years ago when I left the military doing cybersecurity until now. Um, this one I always kind of laugh at. I just like to throw it up here. Like, it's not really the truth, but it is very good. So, um, and I'll talk to you about some of my experiences from when I left the military to where I'm at now. And it's just an amazing 10 years. And I'm very lucky to be where I am, especially working with Amazon, but you can too right? You can too. If you are motivated, which all of you are, because you wouldn't be here today, right? You can get good jobs in cybersecurity, especially out in the industry and other jobs as well, not just cybersecurity jobs, right? Uh, we'll talk more about that in a second. So this is kind of the current state of the nation. Now I got this from a website. Let me post it here in the chat for you. It's called CyberSeek, right? And it uses AI data, CompTIA data, government data, BLS data, to form what is going on in cybersecurity in the nation right now. And as you can see, we have 770 almost open cybersecurity positions. Now, I can tell you four years ago, just well, five years ago, if you go back to the Internet Archive and look at previous versions of this website, you'll see that it was only 250,000 at one point. And just in that five years, it has tripled the number of open positions. And what has also tripled is the number of actual cybersecurity professionals that are currently employed. So the US, U.S. needs about 1.9 million cybersecurity professionals, but it only has 1.1 right now. And a lot of people are getting desperate to hire that talent because what you can see is we used to see a lot of banks getting hacked. We used to see a lot of you know the military, the government getting hacked. Well, they've become very hard targets in general, right? So what cybersecurity, what, what, what APT groups and what these criminals are doing is they're starting to start going to those secondary institutions that are not traditional IT users, like, for example, automotive companies, uh, manufacturing facilities, meatpacking plants, uh, you know, the, the water industry, the, the mining industry, right? You're starting to see all of them because they can make money off of ransomware at those places, too. Colonial Pipeline is a great example, right, of where something they never really faced traditional cybersecurity threats until their, until their you know, their, their software was taken down. Not the pipeline software, but the actual Windows stuff in the background that was running their building systems, right? But you saw the impact that it had. And the U.S. government and these industries and these sectors are starting to invest heavily in cybersecurity. But that starts with people. Right. There is no single piece of equipment out there that you can put in your company. I'm, vendors will try to tell you this, of course. Right. God love vendors. We do. But they will try to tell you, oh, if you just buy this, your cybersecurity problems are solved. It's not true. And most vendors will tell you that's not true. Right. you got to have people knowing what they're doing. Equifax had really good equipment. Equifax at the time did not know what they were doing. Right. And they managed their cybersecurity very, very poorly. Capital One had great equipment and good money, and they made a lot of human mistakes that led to a breach of a, a million credit card applications, right? And you can kind of see this in these postmortems that are that are happened after. Uh, Jamie Farsici, who's the new current CISO at Equifax, fantastic person, um, has really turned it around and turned it into a world-class cyber organization. But I'm pretty sure Equifax would have preferred to have a world-class cyber organization to start with, right? And a lot of this comes down to people and experience, and that's why desperately need ex-military, right? We have that experience. And even if we weren't doing cyber in the military, we have a lot of skills and, and just attitudes and motivations that make us great employees. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that a little bit of how to, how to do that. So if you look across the nation, right? The darker blue means the more cybersecurity jobs needed. It's usually California and Texas are number one, right? California always had Silicon Valley. They have a lot of people returning to office out there. You know, they'd like a lot of people to come back and work in the state. Texas is, is of course, no taxes, why I retired here. Um, and, and you're seeing a lot of movement of businesses to move into like permissible areas like California, like Texas and Florida, for example, because of that kind of no tax, low tax environment. So you're seeing a lot of growth there. Um, again, I live in San Antonio and I work out of Austin, right? So two really big growing cyber hubs there in the state of Texas. Uh, then you got Virginia, of course, around the DC area and a lot of that you know growth that's happening there. And of course, Florida, and then you got some other places even down like New York and then Pennsylvania, Illinois, and a couple other places. Colorado, for example, is a great one that's on the map. So there is, and, and again, even the lightest ones are still need cybersecurity jobs. Montana needs cybersecurity people, right? It just doesn't compare to what California or Florida needs. So that puts all of you and any of us in the cybersecurity industry in a great position, right? We're being headhunted now. People are trying to find us. If you're going to start a career in cybersecurity, you know, now is a really good time to do that, right? Because you have these opportunities, right? Um, I joined the Army in 1991, and 
you know, they were just happy to get people in the army at the time. Like, you know, like I'll just say my MEPS evaluation was very quick, right? Uh, nowadays, right, my son joined the Air Force and what he went through, I was just utterly amazed about how difficult it is now to get through MEPS, right? And what a lot of you probably have experienced since then. Um, but it is good to be outside the military once you finish your career. And it is a great time to do so. And there is money to be made and, and new careers. And just it's, it's just the new kind of things that you will see, the new challenges you'll face outside of the military, right? And a lot of times in the military, especially if you do cyber, um, like I did cyber the last five or six years of my career, we called it computer network defense back then, of course. Um, it became kind of like us versus the bureaucracy always right that's kind of the you know we love our military but like the army for example is the big green machine right it's it is what it is right you can't change a lot of it uh, you can make changes my first job out of the military you know i had a cio going do it do it like that was his attitude there was no like eight levels of government approval and six army regulations to look at it was like just do it you know get it done make it make us secure right and that was fantastic and and, and over that period of time i learned a lot we're going to talk about job postings, resumes, some stuff I've learned, interviews, uh, all that kind of stuff here later in the presentation after I get through some of the Amazon stuff and how Amazon is helping. And again, feel free to ask questions. We're gonna have some time at the end um, if I don't talk too much, uh, but if not, there's always a boost. And, and also I encourage everybody, if you wanna follow me on LinkedIn, uh, if you wanna connect with me, just you know send a note to connect with me and I'll connect back, but um, love talking to vets. And so does our military affairs team, they are all former military, every one of them. And it is an amazing group of people. Never met someone like this before. So tell me if you can hear this when I start this. Ah, darn. Yeah, sorry, I thought that was gonna happen. So uh, let, me, uh, let me put the link in here for you. There's another video in the expo. So let me just share this with you if you guys want to keep it. Now, one thing I have learned over the years, um, I just keep, I keep a bookmark folder and I just keep every bookmark I've ever been given, right? You just never know this is going to be useful. But this is a really great story um, about Jeff Bezos' commitment to the military. And he is very, very pro-military, right? And how we do it. Um, this is a great example so of something he said. So we actively seek leaders who can invent, think big, have a bias for action and deliver results on behalf of our customers. Amazon is a very, we, we call it day one at Amazon, right? Even though I've been here three months, that is just a pervade. I've never seen this kind of culture before at any company in my 10 years of experience, right? Where every single day they're just doing stuff. I mean, they literally like, that's a great idea. Let's do it. That's a great idea. Let's do it. They actually have a culture that, you know, one person can do something, one person can do something. And at the end, that's okay. I mean, it's such a large company and we'll talk about that, but that kind of attitude, that kind of go get them, right? That, that we bring out of our experience in the military is something that's very desperately wanted at Amazon. They are not like the other kind of tech companies. And I, I've not worked at Google or Apple and Microsoft and I'm not downing any of them. I think there's great positions there, but I have just never even seen or heard of anything the way we do it. Matter of fact, your interview at Amazon is not like a normal interview at another company. We have leadership principles. Right. And you have to talk about how, what you've done based on these leadership principles. I mean, come on, you, you, all of us live and breathe leadership experience. Right. You know, I was a, I, I still remember a long time ago going to PLDC in Panama at the time. Right. Becoming a corporal. And, and, you know, and there I am, you know, 20 years old. You know what I mean? And I'm leading people. And that's just something you don't see in the private sector. Your experience of leadership and just being in leadership teams is something that's very desperately wanted at Amazon and, and just their culture around these leadership principles. For example, one of them on the screen there is bias for action. Now, I, now we, don't, we say none of them are all important than others, but let's face it, bias for action is something that uh, former military live and breathe, right? We don't wait, we just do, right? And that's kind, of the, that's kind of the attitude at Amazon there. Now let's just compare how big Amazon is, right? So Amazon is the second, lar second largest employer um, in the United States. Walmart is like, 2 million or something in that I can't remember recently, but they're a big company, but they have a lot, a lot of physical stores, right? So if you look at the total armed services as of 2022, right, we're looking at 1.3 million active duty, right? Amazon is currently at 1.468 million and actually it's gone up. And the kind of neat thing at Amazon is once you work at Amazon, you have this thing called the phone tool. And there's a little, uh, there's a little thing on it that tells you how many people were hired before and after you. 
And those numbers are amazing, right? When you kind of see it, you kind of see how many people they're bringing in. In the city of Austin alone, they've hired a thousand people in three months since I've been there. I, I'm starting to feel like a veteran and I've been there a little over 90 days, right? And it's kind of amazing how fast places like Amazon grow, right? You know what I mean? They're, everybody needs Amazon. Matter of fact, I spend a lot of my time, I'm going to be honest with you, trying to make sure my daughters don't give my entire paycheck back to Amazon through the app, right? As we do it. But it is a very, very kind of interesting company. I just cannot sing enough of its praises, right? It's, it's exciting to work at a place like this. Um, so Amazon has a veteran commitment, a very large veteran commitment, right? Back in 2016, they said they were going to hire 25,000 veterans or spouses, and they did it, right? In 2021, last year, they committed to 100,000 by 2024. And guess what? They're going to do it. They're currently at 60,000. They need another 40,000 military veterans and spouses to do it. And I've, I've worked with this military affairs team that you're going to talk to when you go to the expo booth and signal, you know, re signal your intent, right? Um, and others, and they are very, I just would not believe it. Like even some of the leaders who've never served in the military, their first thing was like, we need to hire military, right? This is a very big deal. And they really like us, right? They really do like us at Amazon. It just, uh, matter of fact, he's the director of military affairs. And that video, if you watch it, the one I just posted there, he has a great talk about it and stuff. And it's just, it's very, very kind of cool, especially all the military gear you get. It's kind of neat. Um, and a lot of the stuff they do for the military. I mean, Amazon is a very, very, very wealthy company, and they do spend that money in a lot of military ways, right? Helping veterans, helping scholarships, and a lot of other stuff that we do. And of course, committing to hire 100,000 of us, right? That's amazing. So the Global Military Affairs Team, which I am here today on behalf of, which I, I thank them quite a bit, um, they actually have a group of uh, several, several hundred military veterans who work solely to try to get, you know, people like me and you hired at Amazon, right? And they spend a lot of effort, a lot of time and a lot of money going to conferences and sponsoring conferences like this one so that we can do it. Amazon sponsored, you know, a large, you know, we, we put some money into this conference and they're glad to do it. And they do it at a lot of them. They go to military bases pretty often. They go to different, you know, other ones as well. Um, and so it is a very, very military friendly organization, right? And I've, I've worked for some that are not military friendly, not USA, right? It was another company back in the day. And I really thought it was funny. So hilariously, my, you know, I first, after I started working at this one company and I met the CIO and the CIO's first words to me, he's like, Jason, he's like, we're real different than the military. He's like, uh, he's like here, if you tell people to do something, they don't always do it. All I'm thinking in the back of my head is like, hey, hey, brother, I never met an 18 year old that would run into bullets because I told him to. <laughs> like, that's not that's not how military leadership works. Right. You know what I mean? That's not how we do it. Or at least that's not how very good leaders do it. Right. And, and I always thought that was interesting, his preconceptions about the military. And we'll talk about some of those, too. And, and you're going to learn to fight back against that and prove people to how you're different. Right. And how you do it. And Amazon, the good thing about Amazon, especially with their military affairs team and the veterans that are Amazon, you don't have to work that hard. There's a lot of us there, right? Uh, met a woman named Sharifa and some other folks up there in Amherst, these people who work on trying to get veterans apprenticeships inside of cybersecurity. So you're getting out of the military, hey, they'll give you an apprenticeship in a lot of cases so you can work at Amazon in the area that you're going to be working in. At the same time, they're going to send you to school. Right. And even in our warehouses and the distribution centers, which are massive, they're paying for college for free. And these huge initiatives that they have out there just to give everybody an opportunity, no matter where you are in Amazon, to to increase your value at the company. Right. We don't want to lose people. We want to hire internally into our security program. And we definitely want to hire veterans. Right. Now, as you can see, we talked about the 100,000 pledge and there's currently 60,000 there. Right. So I'm sure we will get to 100,000 by 2024. And I'm sure we will have another goal after that to get to an even higher number after that. It, you know, they're not going to go to 100,000 and go like, done, we're good. You know, we, we made the pledge. As you can see, it went from 25 to 100. I, I think it's going to go higher. Right. Especially as the military changes and, and as people transition out with the experience that we have. Right. Especially a lot of the hard earned experience that you've had over the past decade or two. Right. Since since the, a lot of the global conflicts started. And right now there are over 30,000, I think this is a low number, there's probably even more, positions open at Amazon. If you want a job at Amazon, you can get it. 
right? And I'll talk to you a little bit about that later about, you know, some options with that, right? And how we kind of think around this stuff, but it is not uncommon to see those military t-shirts everywhere, right? I have like three of them by now is like my first thing of like, I want the military t-shirt, you know, buying it off our swag store when I first started working here. So the first one, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of them real quick, and you can find more of them on these links right here as you go through it. Um, uh, first one is the Hiring Our Heroes Corporate Fellowship Program, right? So uh, they prepare candidates for a smooth transition to a civilian career. So what it does, and, and, and also at Amazon, there's programs. So let's say you just get hired at Amazon and you've never worked in the civilian sector. Amazon actually has affinity groups that you can join and they will give you training. Like, for example, how does, how does Amazon pay work in the civilian world? You know, how do deductions work in the military? I mean, in the civilian world, right? We don't have LESs anymore. We don't have DFAS to complain about, right? How does that actually work for you? And a lot of these other skills that, you know, what I call life skills that we just don't have. Like I joined the military, my, my previous employment prior to Ar the army was Hardy's restaurants in Bloomington, Illinois, right? I, for 20 plus years, I had no idea how this kind of stuff works or, or the, 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 you know, the, the faux pas you may actually commit and stuff like that. Um, so uh, you must be within 100 days of transition and uh, for military service for the duration of the program. And so please get a chance to go check that out um, as one of them if you're interested in that as well. And again, go to the expo booth, signal your intent. They will reach out to you and start working with you. Uh, the Amazon SkillBridge Fellowship is another one. It's another one uh, if you're separating within 180 days. Um, and it's part of a DOD program called SkillBridge, right? And Amazon is one of the people that's a founding partner of that, that you can actually be involved with as well. And again, to learn more about these programs, you know, go to the expo booth, signal your intent when this presentation's over. Um, and, you know, please do, please do. All right, so Military Pathways is another one. Oh, sorry, did I go back the other way? No, Military Pathways is another one. Um, so uh, they also provide a military skills translator where you go in there. Now, one of the things I'll talk about here in a little bit when we get into resumes and stuff, right, is that, you know, the jargon we use. So, for example, in the Army, I was um, was I was a 19 Alpha, right, armor, right, when I became an officer. Um, and then I became something called an FA-53. Literally, no one understands that. <laughs> no one even understands the numbers we use. It's like it's like going in there and trying to explain stuff. They just don't have that concept, right? And a lot of what the private sector understands about the military, unfortunately, is through movies, which we all know how that works, right? You know what I mean? Um, you know, some good, hoorah, but they're usually almost always wrong, right? Um, and you're going to be kind of fighting against that in some places. Not so much at Amazon. I'll be honest with you. I've not had that at Amazon where somebody has come up to me and go like, hey, you know, like they don't understand. What, although I've, I've been out for kind of 10 years by now. But again, you don't have that as much as Amazon. We have a lot of vets here. And that video also shows, especially some of our wounded warriors that work in Amazon, especially a first sergeant who's incredibly an amazing person uh, that they showcase in that video that I linked earlier. Uh, last one also, we want to hire military spouses, right? Currently, there's more than 10,000 military spouses, and they have flexible arrangements for jobs too, right? If, if you PCS then, and there's an Amazon place by, or you can work from home in some cases, right? They're going to keep you. They're going to they're gonna work with you on that, right? And again, it's part of that 100,000 pledge to be able to hire our spouses, right, who pick up all that slack for us and do all the work for us uh, when we're out, you know, road marching and jumping from airplanes and all the other kind of crazy stuff that we've done over the years. Um, yeah, awesome. Thanks, Anour. Thanks for thanks for posting that. So, and again, and I like to highlight the bottom of these slides, right? So, no matter your military rank or specialty, Amazon has a job for you, right? We will find you a job. And and again, what I like to talk about too is when you get out of the military, and I had this exact same. I was like, I am going to be a vice president, a CISO, or whatever it is. I have, you know, I've been in Iraq and I've commanded and I've done all these great things, right? And, and, uh, and, and that's not the way the private sector works. And you don't need that to be successful, right? But, you know, a lot of us, you know, think we're going to get that dream job. And we don't get the dream job. We, we kind of get disappointed a little, right? It happened to me. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But guess what? That's okay. I call that dream adjacent. A lot of times getting a job in a company is a good thing because it's easier to get hired internally for another role. Right. USAA, Amazon, they're both very much like that. Right. Especially when I worked at USA, Amazon is very much like that. You know, so, you know, we focus on trying to hire veterans and, of course, veterans that work in our operations centers. Right. We try to give them opportunities to move up as well um, instead of just, you know, instead of just picking other people over them. So 
let's go through some of my experience, right? You can all laugh along with me or laugh at me. I'm good with either. I have four children, three daughters, right? So knock yourselves out, right? Um, but some of the stuff that I learned the hard way coming out of the military, and please in the chat, you know, reinforce it. Do you agree? Do you not agree? Right? I'd like to hear your feedback as we go through it, because this is kind of a new part that I've never really kind of spoken about before. Because um, usually I don't speak to military. I speak to a lot of private sector folks about stuff. And so they don't kind of get some of this. So when I say it's a new chapter in your life, I don't care how long you've been in the military, right? When you're in the military, you are in, you are enmeshed in this culture that is a day and night thing, right? You're a soldier 24 hours a day. You're a sailor 24 hours a day, right? We, we kind of say those kind of things as we go through it. And we mean it, right? You go downtown and get in trouble. Uh, your day job is going to hear about it, right? That's just all there is to it, you know? Um, that is not the way the private sector works. And it is going to be quite the adjustment for all of us, right? It was really hard for me. I'm, I'm not talking about the fact that, yay, I don't have to get up at five o'clock in the morning to be anywhere uh, unless it's a job, but it is a change in your life. And you have to understand that and take that. Because what a lot of people will do and go into the private sector is you try to keep going back to that. Well, I should be this, I should be this, I should be doing this. That's not the case. Like it is, it is quite literally a new chapter in your life. And especially for a lot of folks who just kind of dwell on that, right? You know what I mean? I've seen a lot of military folks who just can't let it go. And I don't mean in bad ways. We're all very proud of what we've done. And we should always be very proud of what we've done because what we have done is by and, bar, by, by and far a lot more than what our peers have in the civilian world, right? That's just a fact. But we got to let it go, right? We got to let it go. We're never going to be sent to Iraq again, probably. Uh, my oldest son is security forces in the Air Force, and he's deploying to Kenya this weekend. And I feel bad because I'm not deploying. It's weird. Even 10 years later, I kind of feel bad because someone I know is going somewhere and I'm not going with them, right? Uh, aside from the whole like, oh, this is how it feels to be a parent when this happens kind of stuff that I'm going through. But again, take it as a new chapter. Don't take it as things are worse or things are different or things are bad, right? Take it as these are new to me and I've got to learn them, right? This one right here was kind of a hard thing as well. Like I left the army as a, as a major Right. I've had all these leadership experiences. Right. You know, tanks and cav and scouts and all this other kind of stuff I did in Afghanistan, Iraq. And you're not going to have that when you get out of the military. And I was kind of frustrated. I was like, why am I not a vice president by now? Right. Why am I not a VP at some company right now? I have way more experience in leadership than these people do. It's just not going to happen like that. You're not. You may have been a first sergeant. You may have been a platoon sergeant. You could have been a squad leader, whatever it is, a company commander, a commander of a ship. Right. You're not gonna you're not gonna transition over and someone's gonna give you a half a billion dollars worth of equipment to take care of, right? You're not gonna suddenly get out of the military and be given 1,000 people to manage. It is very different. And the skills you need to do that in the private sector is much different than the skills we learned in the military. Now, does that mean that what we learned in the military is not applicable? Oh no, you're ahead of the game, right? That is a that is an absolute fact. I have always felt that that I am ahead of the game because I know how to react to situations without freaking out, right? You know what I mean? Like we've had our freak outs. We learned how to get past that. And if we wouldn't, weren't successful at it, we probably wouldn't be here today in this conference, right? So understand that that is okay, right? Because this next one is gonna be what's really important. Um, titles are less important than compensation. Now we always kind of say that I'm out here for the money. But you have no idea. My very first job out of the military was an individual contributor as a project manager. And I still made $35,000 more than a major does right? First job out of the military, $35,000 more. I was so terrified that I would not be able to make enough money to cover my BAH and my house payment, right? And they were like, so sorry, it's so low. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, now, and then 10 years later, right, you'll get into positions where you, you make more in a couple months than you did all year, right, in the military. And that is good. The title is not important. A lot of people get out of the military and they focus on those titles, especially those of us who retired. It's really harder for us, right? Because you come out with a title, right? You're not going to have that title in the real world, right? You got to let it go. It is okay. I was a project manager, right? An individual contributor, my first role out of the military, the first time in 20 years, I had never led people, right? Or had to be responsible for people or had to do other of those kind of level things that we had. And that is good, right? That is good. Because what you want to do is pay the bills. Number one, pay the bills, right? Sorry, my mouse is not working here. There we go. There are conceptions and misconceptions of veterans. And I kind of spoke of one earlier, a misconception that we just tell people what to do and they just charge into combat, right? 
That's not how anything works. We all know the definition of motivation, right? That is trying to get other people to want to do what you need to get done. That is no different than the private sector. It's just a little different. They are going to have preconceptions about veterans, especially if you go work for, I went to work for an insurance company where there were no veterans, literally no veterans at all, right? In, in the department that I worked at. And they always had like, oh, you're going to be too hard and you're going to be this and everything has to be proper. Well, they had never met Jason Edwards, so let's face that one there. But, you know, they're going to have some misconceptions about you and you're going to have to do what you've always done. Learn them and defeat them, right? And prove to other people, yeah, you're going to have to prove yourself again. You can't just say, I did this and went to Syria and therefore I'm capable of doing X. You're going to have to prove it again. Right now in the military, we don't usually do that. You go to the next unit, you wear your awards, you got your ERB, you're right, you got that other stuff that says where you've been, right? You got a combat patch or something, right? In the army, um, people look at you and go, oh, you've done stuff. You're still a little bit of proving yourself at a new unit, but not as much as what I would say is going to happen to you in the private sector, right? And again, there are going to be people looking for you to reinforce their misbeliefs about you because one day you get into an argument with somebody like, ah, he does that because he's military right? That's not the case. Now, there are other things that affect us, right? PTSD and other stuff that you may not even realize you have, which you should be going to get your VA benefits, you know, they will affect us, right? And, and here's what I say to some people. Guess what? Everybody plays the video game at a different difficulty level. Some people have it set on easy, right? I can name quite a few celebrities who I firmly believe God set them on easy, right? Uh, on how they play this game. We are not at that difficulty level. You are going to have different difficulty levels, but at the end of the day, you got to beat the game, right? You got to beat the game and you can do it, right? Of any population in this country, you are easily the most qualified to make this happen, right? But you got to be self-reflective enough to understand these kind of things as you go through it, right? Work hours and pacing is a great example of this because they are much different in the private sector they are in the military my first like two weeks of my job i'm trying to get stuff done it's like 6 30 in the evening and the ceo is like what are you doing like i was like well i gotta get this done he's like no you don't <laughs> like he was like he's like we have a thing called home life right you know what i mean and he's like you get the hell out of here right you know and he was like get out get out right so uh and i left and there was no working on the weekends like he frowned upon that severely his thing was if you can't get it done between eight and five you know then there's a problem with it, right? And so I never, you know, I never, you know, we would have outages and incidents and stuff that we'd have to pull incident response or do something like that for. And those were like all nighters and stuff. And those were kind of like, like, oh my God, we're going to be up until two in the morning. This is my moment. You know what I mean? Like I got this down. Well, uh, it's just different. You can't expect people. And, and they didn't, they don't, they don't have that experience of us where we just go, 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 go and get the mission done, right? It is good that we do that but your pacing is different in the private sector. And guess what? That is okay, right? That is okay. It's gonna bother you, but it's okay. And lastly, it's just another challenge for you. Like every military school, all of us here went to some kind of basic training, right? Uh, I was enlisted before, I remember basic training. I remember crying like every other 18 year old, like, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever. And then 20 years later, like, that was easy, right? Watching my son go through it. Um, it is a different challenge and you got to take it as that. Don't take it as like, oh my God, this is too hard or oh my God, these people don't understand. Challenge yourself to help people understand, right? Challenge yourself to be self-reflective and step back and go, maybe this is not the right way. I need to get this done. All right, so let's talk about some job postings and stuff you need to know, right? That you may have not have learned when I got out. I love the transition folks at Fort Sam Houston. They were really, really good. But what I have noticed after I got out is like, they never had a private job. Right. They all work for a contractor who works for the base who does this or they were DA civilians. Right. They did it. Working for a contractor or a DA or, or, or U.S. government is different than the private sector. If you send a resume right to and we'll talk about resumes in a minute to a contractor, they're going to know what that means. They know what platoon sergeant means. They understand what that responsibility was. Private sector will not. The first thing, the most important thing about job postings that you need to look at is the things called basic qualifications, because here's the secret that they don't tell you. When you send a resume to a job posting, it is not the cybersecurity person that's gonna look at it first. That's not the way it's done, right? There are so many legal and laws and stuff that are involved in hiring right now, and they're good, right? We have a lot of them for bias and stuff like that, right, that we reinforce. There's gonna be someone from HR or what we call talent acquisition is gonna look at your resume first. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna look at the basic qualifications of the job, they're gonna look at your resume. Make it easy, for them to find it, right? Right. We'll talk about that here in a minute, 
but understand what those basic qualifications are. Don't just assume, look them up, or ask questions. Absolutely, you can, absolutely, to that chat, absolutely. Referrals increase the likelihood of getting to an interview. If you know someone at the company or you're connected with them and you ask them to refer you, you have a much higher chance of getting a job in that company. That is the unwritten rule that people do not tell you when you get out. Networking is important, right? Go to that company's LinkedIn page, look at its employees, find a veteran, connect with them and ask them to refer you, right? Companies prefer referrals over just straight up job postings. Why is that? Because a company is not worried about finding people. All companies can find people, right? They may have to dial down the, 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 the you know, they have to lower their expectations in some cases or increase their salary expectations to do that. And some companies don't make that choice and they have, you know, Colonial Pipeline is a great example of that. Um, but they know that if someone in the company refers somebody else, a friend of theirs, someone that they know, then when that person comes on, they have a much higher percentage of staying with that company six to 12 months, right? Because if you leave before six months, that company lost money on you, right? They lost the money they paid you, they lost money, the, the opportunities of the other people they could have hired and other stuff, training and the hours that they spend with you, right? But if you have a friend in the company or someone you know in the company that you can lean on, you are much more successful at that company, which is why they prefer referrals. Okay. The other thing about with the job posting is that you're not trying to get the job. You're trying to get an interview, right? And I'll talk about interviews in a minute, but you need to make sure that that posting in your resume, you know, that you're focused on that job posting, right? And remember, you're not swinging for the fences. You're swinging for an interview. Don't spam all job postings with just one resume. You will waste them, right? And once you apply for a job, you can't reapply for that same position. You don't get a second chance in the civilian world when you when you apply for a job. There's no going back, right? And if you take the same resume and you just shoot it out to 100 places, I, it's rarely going to get you an interview. Okay, It's not, right? You may get one, possibly. You want to increase that percentage. So you need to look at the job posting, look at your resume and go, hey, if I didn't know anything about myself, how would I be able to tell if I meet the basic qualifications of this job? Guess what? Spell it out for them, right? My resume has a section about me right? And I can change all those bullets at will for the different job postings I have and focus on that or other stuff in there. Yeah, it takes more time. You may spend an hour posting for a job that you may not get, but you are increasing your chances of actually getting an interview out of that. Use recruiters, right? There are a ton of people out there called recruiters, right? And not just the recruiters that work for a company, external recruiters, like third-party recruiters that are out there. They get paid if you get paid, right? My very first three jobs I ever got out of the military were all by recruiters, right? So for example, the first uh, directorship I got at that energy company, the recruiter was paid like $30,000 upfront for me to get that job for her. And she was, you know, what they do is, you know, their HR doesn't want to go through all the problems with it. They have a recruiter go out and find and interview candidates and find the right ones and then submit them for interviews, right? And then she got like another $30,000 uh, six months after I had been at that company, I had left. So they encourage recruiters to help keep you at the company, and that's how they do it. Uh, some recruiters are good. Some recruiters are not, and you will find that, especially some will ghost you. And I, I really hate that. Most of them are not doing it anymore. We've kind of shamed them into stop doing that. But consider using recruiters to help you find a job. Now, here's one thing that you may not know. If you apply for a job on a company's website, and then you go out and find a recruiter who wants to help you get that job, they can't do it in some cases. They can't. So it's, it's kind of their contract with some of these companies. Here's the other thing that's very hard. It was really hard on me. Why didn't I get the job? You're not going to know. Companies will not tell you. And the reason for that is if they tell you anything, it opens them up to a lawsuit. And so companies have the standard blurb email that you're going to get. Hey, thank you for applying for this position. Uh, at this time, your whatever qualifications don't meet what we're looking for, or, or they'll say something like, we've decided to move on with a different candidate. You know, Thank you for your interest in it. Please take a look at other job postings. But that is the generic thing you will get. Now, if you work through a recruiter, a recruiter can sometimes tell you, you know, like, hey, you know what? Don't fart in your interview. <laughs> That's a bad thing. It didn't happen to me, but I just think that'd be funny. Um, but the company will never tell you. So you don't know what you did wrong in some cases, which is why it's very important to network with other people who can help you, right? Yeah, it, and you don't. And you want feedback, right? You just want honest feedback. I remember calling this one job and I'm like, can you tell me? Like, you know, was there something I need to change on it? And they're like, you lack capital experience. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that meant. I don't know what capital experience meant, right? It took me a while to figure that out. But again, and we'll talk about resumes here in a second. 
have patience. You're going to get a job, right? I was terrified the day I left and I didn't have a job yet lined up, right? I was still applying at places. I was literally terrified. You know, I had my, I had my ETI, I had my terminal pay. I had my leave. I was burning off. I was fine, right? You know what I mean? But I was terrified that the day I left the military, I didn't have a job, okay? So, um, and that's a good one, yeah, too, right? The referrals, yeah. So have patience. Continue to press forward with all the things that you're going to learn here and other places to get that position. All right, resumes. Now, the other thing is some resumes are called CVEs, curriculum vital or whatever. Uh, so don't freak out if you see the word CV because I was like, CV, CVE, what does that mean, right? Um, and then you know, I finally figured it out, right? So anyway, it just means resume. Why can't they say resume? I don't know. First of all, make it nice. Do not use just a complete list of text, right? It's boring. Don't do it. Now, also, I'm not saying go in there and make your whole resume red, white, and blue with pictures of bunnies, right? Don't be doing that, like Iwo Jima flag raising. Like, no, 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 don't that. There's a ton of examples out there. Mine is blue with some gold, and it's got white spaces where, you know, black text is on it with some fonts and other stuff like that, right? Make it a little bit nicer. Take your time on it, because someone who doesn't know you is going to look at this, and they're going to gain an immediate impression, right? If you make spelling errors, right, that's a no-go on a resume. And, and here's the hard thing. When you read your resume 87 times, you're not even going to catch it. You have to have other people look at it for you, right? You do. All right, data and metrics, but avoid some common mistakes, right? It is very common for a military resume to say, I was responsible for 14 soldiers, two officers, and half a billion dollars worth of tanks. What does that mean? What does that mean to, to someone in the private sector? It means nothing. Right. They you're, you're by the way, in the military, you're going to have some spectacular hand receipt number that you're always going to be responsible for. Right. You know, I saw one and it was from a, it was from an Air Force officer and it was like, you know, three billion dollars worth of airplanes or something. And I'm like, and what is that going to do for us? Focus on other stuff. Hey, my you know, I continuously drove 97 percent performance from my company in all required training and blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, I had 100% mission on time rate, even though blah, 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 all of this stuff. Performance metrics, not what your hand receipt accounted for. Performance metrics, okay? No evaluation bullets, right? Um, I have literally seen people's LinkedIn. That was their Air Force OER, right? And, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, I don't care if you were the number one post office. Like, I don't care. Right, like that, that's a horrible thing to put on there. I was the NCUIC of the DUM at Fort Gordon. Well, first of all, nobody knows what that means. Nobody knows what NCUIC means, right? You know, don't use OER, NCUER, ER bullets on your resume. You're gonna have to write them in a format that people can understand outside the military. Focus on outcomes. I did this and this is what resulted in, right? Again, go back up to data and metrics. Most recent resume first, if you submit a resume and you go in and change the resume, right, they're only going to look at the most recent one as they do it, if they allow that. But let me tell you right now, 90% of job postings out there will not allow you to put more than one resume on the exact same job posting, right? Sometimes it'll let you go in and edit it, but once that thing gets submitted and locked, you rarely have the opportunity to change that resume, right? And, and your first thought's going to be like, let me email somebody there and ask them. Maybe that works, maybe it doesn't, right? But a lot of times, just the way the recruiting process goes, they will look at the resume that was submitted. So even later on, if you submit a new one, they may not look at it, right? You got to get it right the first time. And you're not, you're not, you're not going to get it right. I, I have not got it right every single time. Like most of it, I have not got it right, but it'll work. One resume per posting, it kind of goes into this. And this is what you need to think about. What I was talking about do not spam your resume out there to a million people because you think these recruiters and these HR people don't see that already and they get tired of it, don't do it. Hey, I want this position that you're offering and blah, 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 and here's exactly why I'm qualified for this, right? And make it match the basic qualifications. Now, I am not a good resume writer. I'll tell you that right now. I have other people help me do it. I, even to this day, I am not a good resume writer. Um, also put on there if you can move, if you're willing to move. Now, we're all military. We've all moved. I think I had like eight or nine different duty stations when I retired, right? Moving was a thing. I don't want to move. My resume is currently saying, I do not want to move, right? Now, if it ever comes down to it, like, you know, the mortgage payment or me moving, pack it up, kids. <laughs> We're going to wherever, right? You may have to do that. But also, if you're willing to move, put it on there, 
right? Put it on there. If you're not tied to a specific place, right? One of my children was special needs a long time ago, and therefore I could not move, right? And that, I told him that. I did not, I can't move because of X, right? When in doubt, hire a professional. My, I have always had my resumes done by a professional. Now I have them do it, and then I'll go in there and tweak it for the different job postings that I have out there. I'm not saying that you can't get it done on your own. I'm not saying that there are programs who can, you know, who can help. There is absolutely programs out there who can help you do resumes, especially for veterans. There is a ton of resources for you out there to help you create resumes and help people build it for you. I just went the route of saying, look, I need to find someone who knows the military, who knows how to write civilian resumes. I need a translator. I knew that. When I was coming out of the military, I knew it because I'm looking at these resumes and like, especially when they said you don't have capital experience, I'm like, no idea what that even meant, right? No idea what that meant. And I am a little bit, I going over, I'm over, right? I go over. Okay, let's get through this real quick, right? Interviews seal the deal, right? If you are already in an interview, that means they're willing to hire you, but you got to knock it out. You got to hit the home run, right? Practice, practice, practice. Do not get carried away in there talking about military experiences. I had a candidate once spend 20 minutes of a 30 minute interview on his, tell me something about yourself. Now that's like three minutes. Give them a chance to talk. Don't spend a lot of time on it. Yeah, star, absolutely on there as well. Okay, LinkedIn social media, um, you need it. You also don't need to do dumb things on there, right? Um, oops, sorry. Don't, it, look, I don't, I don't care what your position on Confederate memorials are, pro or con. Just keep it off your LinkedIn, right? Don't post about jobs, post about cyber, post about your career field, post about military experiences. Those are all fantastic things to post about. Post news articles, right? But avoid the traps of social media. I once had someone on a post I put on LinkedIn eat, text me and they're like, hey, can you remove my comments? And it was like two guys getting in an argument over uh, the, sw the swim test at Marine Corps basic training and they were gonna kill each other. I was like, you idiots? Like, no, you know what I mean? And I've seen that on other posts too. I'm like, just stop it. Like, I don't care what president you vote for. Keep it to yourself. Don't put it on there, right? Pro or con, just leave it out. Unless you're going to work for a political organization, don't even do it. Just ignore politics completely. Ignore your feelings about it. Make sure your Twitter is clean. Make sure your Facebook is closed, right? Because yes, people will Google you before they get you into an interview. I do it for every person that I've ever interviewed, right? Out there. All right. So I am sorry I went a little bit over. Um, but again, uh, you can always add me on, on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, you do not want to know, Joe. I have seen so many people lose jobs over that kind of stuff. Just don't do it. That is my personal email address. When you go to my LinkedIn and request a connection, it's going to ask you for that email address. If you forget it, that's fine. Just send me a message on LinkedIn and I will return and connect with you. Um, I have like 60 or 70,000 followers on LinkedIn. It's a lot of fun, right? And I just do everything wrong on LinkedIn, so which I think it's kind of fun. But anyway, I wish the best to all of you and I hope you apply at Amazon. Please go to the expo, signal your intent right? And have someone reach out to you. Okay. And best wishes to all of you. And thank you. Right. Hopefully it was interesting. Right. So like, my beagle wasn't doing too many crazy things in the background, like licking himself accidentally. So God help me that happened before. So, all right. Thank you all. Thanks everybody.